So what we want to do is cultivate the compa uh, cultivate a capacity for kindness. So close your eyes. Take a few moments to breathe in and breathe out. So what we want to do is cultivate the compa uh, cultivate a capacity for kindness. So close your eyes. Take a few moments to breathe in and breathe out. Thank you.
So what we want to do is cultivate the compa uh, cultivate a capacity for kindness. So close your eyes. Take a few moments to breathe in and breathe out. chat let's get started ah is bothering anybody else they're uneven okay welcome to another healthy gamer gg stream my name is Alok oak kenojo well uh a reminder that although i'm a psychiatrist nothing we discuss on stream today is intended to be taken as medical advice everything is for educational or entertainment purposes only if y'all have a concern or question please go see a licensed professional ah <sighs> It's so nice to be back. Um, it's nice to see everybody again. I have missed y'all. Uh, we're only going to be streaming one day this week. I'm taking a couple days off for the Thanksgiving holiday. Um, I'm probably going to be doing some work, but I'm going to take a small break from streaming. We'll be back next week. But it's it's really nice to at least uh, check in with y'all today. So um, for those of you that don't know, I was uh, giving a keynote speech at a conference in Spain, um, which was awesome, by the way. So I was at the Enlight Ed conference. It's the fifth annual um, meeting of Enlighted. And the conference is actually super cool. One of the coolest conferences I've been to. So it's all about innovation in education. So I think that like what's really neat about the work that Enlighted is doing is that they've sort of recognized that like education is changing and then educational needs are changing. And also that the educational capabilities of the world are changing. We're able to teach in ways that we weren't able to before. And what we need to teach has cha changed drastically. So it's a really cool place where they like, basically the, car the focus is like innovation of, of education, but there's a lot of like entrepreneurship. There's a lot of um, just people from all walks of life that are kind of like related to education. It was really uh, very eye-opening for me. Um, it was also, I've, I've never been to Madrid before. And so that was like actually super cool. Um, I was very surprised. I'm really curious about how people in Spain, especially, or like if there's like changes in their epidemiology, at least in, in terms of like mental health, because one thing that I thought was really neat was just how communal the place is. Like I saw the fewest cell phones at dinner that I've seen in years. So if you go to like most places and you like go eat somewhere, like you know, people will be on their cell phone. But I saw almost no one on their cell phone, which is shocking. Um, which was cool. But it was it was also neat to, you know, learn a little bit more about what's going on in the world and and talk to people about their experiences, what they're building, stuff like that. Um yeah, so so rock and roll is saying because they're boomers, but that's the, what really surprised me is so like I went out to, you know, like a tapas place and like it, actually, so one thing that was kind of neat was that there was a more mixing of ages. So like generally speaking, like in the U.S., I feel like you go to places where there are older people and places that are younger people and there are like different crowds. Like I remember when I was an undergrad there were like the places that the undergrads went and one street over is where like young professionals would go out like bars basically. So there's like the sixth street, which is where all the undergrads go. And then there's like fourth street, which is like where young adults who are hip, but have jobs and can afford things go. And then there are like other parts of town where like older people go when they're kind of going out. 
And I was surprised by, first of all, that there's like less barriers between ages there, which I thought was pretty cool. And secondly, th there actually weren't, it wasn't like, all boomers it was actually a lot of young people who would like go out and they would hang out together and just chill um so yeah so well i'm curious though right so spain apparently though has a pretty high unemployment rate i was surprised to discover that their unemployment rate is 12 percent. so who knows um but it was it was cool to like be immersed in a slightly different culture for a few days and and see things. I went to a museum or two, which was a super awesome, actually. Um, I also I, I don't know. So I <laughs> it's kind of funny. One thing that I'm curious about. So I, I'd never seen Pablo Picasso's artwork, um, and I don't know if you guys like. I, we just did a lecture before I left on bipolar disorder and creativity, and I think I cited that people there are historical accounts that Picasso was, um, uh, was probably bipolar. And then I saw some of his artwork and I was like, oh, this makes so much sense. So I, I want to show you all something. This is kind of completely off script, but, um, and then, <sighs> So I want to show you all something. So here is, so I was looking at his artwork, right? And I just given this, this lecture about bipolar disorder and creativity. So I don't know if y'all remember, but we talked about, um, this guy, Brian Charnley. So this is Brian Charnley, who was, this is a guy who had, uh, I think he had some kind of psychotic disorder. I don't remember exactly what his diagnosis was. But he worked with a journalist, went off of his medication, and then made a series of portraits. So if you look at, like, Brian Charnley's artwork, right? So that was, like, the first—this is the first one. It was, like, a normal self-portrait, and, like, things are getting weird. And then, like, things are getting weirder, right? So we'll, we're starting to see, like, a breakdown of form. And then now, like, there's all kinds of weirdness going on. And then you look at Picasso's artwork, and it's like, wait a minute. This looks kind of familiar. Like, this looks kind of like Brian Charnley's artwork. You get what I'm saying? So, and I was just, I, I, I saw some things that were even like this, right? So this is like, it, it looks somewhat similar. And so it makes me wonder a little bit about how much of Picasso's art was actually inspired by psychotic experiences this looks worse right so this looks like more aggressive and i think charnley ended up committing suicide so you know maybe he wasn't doing the best when he was doing these kinds of things but i thought it was just really interesting how so much of the artwork was similar to brian charnley's self-portraits really makes me wonder about just the history of artistic creation and and really like how much what we call mental illness factors into creative output. I know we just gave a lecture about that, but I thought it was just like, I was just there in the museum and they had like some Picassos hang, hanging out, hanging on the walls. And I went and saw it. I was like, oh, that looks like Brian Charlie's artwork. Oh, that's like, that's the psychotic mania that I, because I've read about this stuff, right? So I'll read like scientific papers and stuff about Picasso, but I've never seen his paintings. Um yeah, so Nate Codes is saying neurodivergence impact on art would be a fascinating study. Yeah, absolutely. I almost I, I wonder about if there's some way that I'll talk to um, you know, our community folks, but I, I wonder if there's some way that we can do some kind of like community event about like exploring some of these aspects of I don't even want to call it mental illness at this point, but just artwork, creativity, and the mental struggles and challenges that we face. Um, but anyway, <laughs> uh, so people, people, I assume are, are, um, trolling, right? There's go off my meds and get, get famous. Yeah. So let's remember that while Brian Charnley did get some amount of fame, it's probably, you know, it cost him quite a bit. And then the other thing to remember, if y'all caught the bipolar disorder and creative creativity lecture 
is that remember that bipolar disorder can be correlated with creative drive, but in terms of creative achievement, untreated bipolar disorder does not lead to creative achievement. So what happens is people are creative, they've got creative drives, but they're too disorganized and can't capitalize on it to like actually create something. So what I tend to see as a clinician, which the evidence kind of bears out, by the way, is that sort of like trying to really find the right regimen to allow your creativity to flourish without letting the bipolar like tank your life is actually what's necessary to create something. So you can have all those impulses and drives, but it's never organized enough or you don't have the follow through to like make it into something. So I think that treatment for bipolar disorder is actually very important. And in my experience, so there's a lot of things that people don't realize. Like I personally think the most important treatment for bipolar disorder is sleep, just a good sleep schedule. And that's worth, you know, I've seen a lot of reductions in medications for bipolar disorder with like good lifestyle and sleep and stuff like that. Not to say that it's a substitute, but I do think that sleep is medicine when it comes to bipolar disorder. So anyway, that's beyond, that's not what we're talking about today. So, um, but I thought it was super cool and we've got other stuff to share with y'all. Um, we'll, we'll see what we can do. If you guys have ideas, if y'all have ideas about what we should do, just let us know. So one thing that I, I want to share with y'all, this is super cool. So we're actually extending right in the feels um, for, we're adding a DLC actually. So right in the feels is our community event, which helps people understand their emotions a little bit better. We're going to be talking a lot about emotions today, but the event has been so successful that we're actually adding a DLC, right? So it seems like people are really benefiting a lot from it. Where uh, I think part of what I'm really happy about with this event is that we talk about stuff um, a lot, but like it's hard in our community to organize ways to actually do things. So uh, one step in this direction, I think, was the guides, which Dr. K's Guide to Mental Health, which like gives people like exercises and worksheets and stuff. So we did that, and that's been actually quite successful. And then we have coaching, obviously. So that's like for the people who are really committed to making a change and really want to see like a lot of progress. Um, but there's there's an element of, I guess, practice, which even coaching can't really offer. So we try to do some things like role play, which can be very, very helpful, like role playing difficult conversations, setting boundaries with people, things like that. That can actually be worth a ton, especially in like work scenarios and stuff like that, not only in terms of stress, but actually like making a positive impact in noticeable areas in your life, asking for promotions, things like that. So career coaching, like all that stuff is going really well. But there's still like a layer of stuff that we were missing. And what I really like about Right in the Feels is it's like sort of like daily quests for boosting your EQ, which is kind of what the event turned into. And it's been so successful that we're actually going to add a DLC for people who are joking about microtransactions. Um, I think the, unfortunately, I hate to break it to y'all, but the Right in the Feels event, the DLC is going to be just as expensive as the main event. Um, and we're not one of these companies that does these like expansions and DLCs at like a, a lesser price, right? So we're we're really following the gaming industry in terms of offering a DLC that is about, let's say, 60% of the content of the main event, um, but it's going to be priced actually exactly the same, unfortunately, um, because, you know, that's just how we roll because the DLC is so good, it's going to be just as expensive as the main event. Um, yeah, mini paradox. <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> tech teller's like, oh my God, no one's going to sign up. For those of y'all that didn't know, it's free. The first event was free. The DLC is free. Right? Because um, <laughs> I guess people didn't know. Oh my God, but it's just as expensive. Let the outrage begin, chat. Oh my God. Yeah, so so sometimes we have to sacrifice the joke. Sometimes, chat, we have to sacrifice the joke to actually make the world a better place. Um, okay, but let's just, I just want to share with y'all a couple things. So we just asked people, um, you know, 
post your experience about participating in the right in the fields event. So here's, you know, so people are just adding stuff. So the biggest change that I noticed is the fact that I have alexithymia took away a lot of insecurity, doubt, and confusion. I felt very much ashamed because I was told throughout my life that I wasn't empathic enough and the advice given was try harder. Realizing that my experience is real helped a lot of unpacking. I'm not even sure exactly what this means, but this sounds fantastic. Um, doing reflection exercises on anger made me realize that I enjoy nitpicking details of someone's work. And when I dug deeper, I realized that I feel deeply threatened when I feel like someone is nitpicking my actions. This helped me realize why certain interactions would just explode and why people said stop nitpicking. It made me realize that I require empathy and understanding before I am able to make meaningful changes. It isn't fair to straight up demand change from someone. The fact that our emotions are clear signals and help with guiding on what kind of situation we're in is also mega helpful. It helps me recognize what is happening around me and means that I can ask for support if I need to. This is like a home run experience, dude. <laughs> Improves personal relationships like taking away insecurity, doubt, and confusion and doing something that is a replacement for getting told to try harder. Um, it also makes it very clear that people around me ex straight up expected me straight up expected that I was already able to do the thing and are frustrated when it turns out that I can't. Interesting. If anything, it, it helped explaining to people what I can and can't do. Dude, this is a huge skill. This is, this is awesome. Huge shout out to Mana Praxula. Um, since October 12th, my life and mood has improved a lot in certain aspects of my emotional awareness. I noticed just in the first two weeks that I was able to uncover some emotions I didn't know I was feeling. Awesome. At all, like tiredness and boredom. I gained better language to explain how I was feeling, but I hadn't experienced major improvements in noticing my emotions until these last two weeks. I've been catching myself wondering why I'm doing what I'm doing a lot more often. For example, I've noticed boredom so much more. It happens almost all the time for me, and I used to barely be aware of it because I would just pick up my phone every time I felt it. I also find myself checking in with my emotions all throughout the day now. So this is awesome because I, I don't think we realize how much these internal emotional signals dictate so much of our life, right? So everyone will like ask questions and look for answers about how to use your phone less. Everyone's like, oh, how do I stop using the internet? And one thing that we've sort of really emphasized is that it, everyone's looking for solutions, but like really what you need is awareness on the boredom. Let's see how what, what ended up happening with this person. I found the reflection corner for the sixth week to be so, so helpful because it allowed me to explore my emotions that I don't normally pick for the journal entry because I don't feel them very often or I only feel them in short spikes so by the time I write an entry, they're gone. It really helped me gain a greater understanding of what these emotions look like and how I actually experience them. So I want to talk about this for a second. So part of the problem with getting like boosts and EQ is that we don't have a form of deliberate practice, right? So we know that deliberate practice is really, really useful. But the challenge is that like, the time we work on our emotions are only the random times that we are both feeling emotion and have time to work on it. Does that kind of make sense? It's like when you sit down and like, let's say I could work on my emotions for an hour, but I'm not feeling anything in that moment. So I, I have nothing to work on. And on the flip side, most of the time when I'm feeling lots of emotions, that's when I don't have any time to work on them. Like obviously, right? Does that kind of make sense? And so the cool thing about this event, we, we didn't know what to expect, by the way, right? So we're, we're, you know, we'll do a bunch of research and stuff and we'll orchestrate an event. But we really don't know, like when we design this stuff, if it's going to work or not. But I think this is really important because this sort of ties, ties those two problems around emotional processing together. The first is working on emotions when you've got time. And the second is like not being able to work on them because you're like feeling them too much and you got stuff to do. Um, the only downside to the event is that I've been mostly happy, so I haven't had a chance to explore some of the other emotions like sadness or anger. Wah. Awesome, dude. That's fantastic. Um, I enjoy doing the emotional regulation, even though I haven't had any extreme emotion. Oh, dude, maybe a woman. 
or non-binary that would have benefited from regulation because it actually gives me a 15 minute block of time to do something productive in my day, like go for the walk or do the dishes. Cool. Um, even besides the helpfulness of it, I found the event to just be a lot of fun. Trying to guess my emotions is kind of like a game I get better at. Absolutely. And so is, is guessing the emotions of others in empathy labs. I look forward to it and it's the first thing I do in the morning. I still think I have more to learn about myself. Um, oh, I also understand character development way more now, which is kind of like a weird side effect. Awesome. So by the way, these keep going, but I guess we'll kind of pause for here. But that's awesome. I think this like, this is kind of what I'm talking about. Like, you know, there are all these tools and stuff, but you know, when people actually use them, it's so cool to see that people are like getting better. Like people are less confused. They're more aware. Their relationships are improving. I am better able to tell other people what I can and can't do, which sounds so simple, but is so hard, right? Like how many of your problems in life are because you can't effectively communicate to people what you can and can't do. And by effectively communicate, that also includes like managing the emotion of letting people down when you communicate to them that you can't do what they ask. And so we're so unaware of that emotion that we let it control us. I don't want to let people down. I don't want to disappoint people. So what I'm going to do is just waffle and not say no. And in doing so, I will create a situation in which they expect me to deliver something, which I know I can't deliver, which is going to create even more anxiety and stress. And then inevitably, it's going to lead to the disappointment that I was trying to avoid in the first place. Like, it's so fucked, man. Y'all get that? And if this person is able to now communicate better, like, that's awesome. That will change your life. No joke. This is what we like. Everyone's like, oh, like, here's five tips to, like, set boundaries on people. No, it's like, it's sure, there are tips and they can be helpful. But it starts by having the emotional awareness of, like, oh, this is actually something that I can't do. And I'm afraid to disappoint people. Let me, like, understand that emotion. Um, just a couple things uh, about the DLC. So we've got self-exploration coming up. Um, so this is a little bit more about who you are and what holds you back. We've, this is super cool. We've got a comms check, which is to learn how to communicate your emotions better. Um, action center, which is overcome emotional resistances to taking action. And then checkpoint, which is reflect on your progress throughout the challenge. So remember that reflection is in and of itself an EQ boosting technique. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Vol Canoe, I'm, I'm with you. Love to hear others benefiting from this community, its events. It's been awesome. So that's why we're doing the DLC, by the way. If people aren't, you know, people are confused, that's why we're doing the DLC. Because people seem to really be benefiting. For those of y'all that are a little bit concerned, but like, hey, I didn't do the event at the beginning. Like, can I still do the DLC? Yeah, you can join at any time. So I think the older things are still active. But remember that just like the people in here, you know, you probably aren't going to see a huge change within a week or two. So that's like the whole point of the challenge and the longitudinality of it, right? So if you think about building any skill, if you cook 10 meals in one day versus one meal over the course of 10, uh, one meal a day <laughs> for 10 days, you're going to learn a lot more from that latter than the former. So that's why part of the reason is that the challenges are spaced out, but I mean, we we tend, we saw a lot of progress within six weeks. The DLC will probably last for another month or so. So there's still time to like hop on board, like hop on board today and you'll have enough time to see progress. I think people were starting to see change within two or three weeks. Okay. All right. So, what? Well, Okay. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> um, where can you join this thing? Hold on. Let's find out. 
All right, so y'all can go to feels.healthygamer.gg. Um. <laughs> so apparently I can whistle in a discernible way. Eloden0451 got it right. <laughs> um, yeah, so exclamation point feels. So today we're going to be talking a little bit more about emotions, okay? So we're going to talk about three things today. We're going to talk a little bit about whether emotions are mental. Second thing that we're going to talk about is a little bit about emotional processing. And third thing we're going to talk about is this dichotomy or this tension between like, does money buy happiness? Okay. Mm. Okay. So I want to talk to you all today a little bit about emotions. And I think it's really important to understand that emotions are not just mental. And that may sound kind of weird because, like, what difference does that make, whether emotions are mental or physical? Like, who really cares? And I think we have to remember that part of the reason we want to understand why emotions are the way they are and where they come from is because emotions actually cause so many of our problems in life. If you think a little bit about the problems that you deal with today, right? So let's talk about, like, a couple of the big ones, like avoidance, things like procrastination. Like, what's going on there? Right? So if I'm avoiding something, people will sort of say, oh, okay, you're avoiding something because there's some kind of emotion. Like you don't want to be disappointed. You're avoiding someone because you don't want to deliver bad news. You're avoiding a conversation because you don't want to let someone down. Also, in terms of procrastination, if you think a little bit about what causes procrastination, there's a really simple way to understand the relationship between emotions and procrastination. If you move towards the task that you are procrastinating pre procrastinating on, notice what happens within you, right? So if I'm like procrastinating for a test, or let's say I have to email a professor for an extension, or I need to call my parents to ask them for a little bit of money, if there's some kind of task that we need to do, right, it's important. And as I think about doing the task, as I move towards the task, there's this like rising like resistance that we experience the closer and closer we get to the task. So if you really kind of tunnel down into that, what you discover is that it's actually like emotion, right? Even when it comes to avoidance, most of the times the things that we're avoiding, oh, I don't want to go to this party because I'm going to feel like an idiot. Um, I'm avoiding this group of people because they make me feel bad and they make, make me make fun of me. If we look at all of these, these things that tend to hold us back in life, they all tend to be kind of emotional in nature. So then the question kind of becomes, okay, so if, if it's emotional in nature, like how do we fix that, right? That's the natural question is how do we fix it? And this is where I think that as a society, we've actually made like a pretty big mistake in the West. And the biggest mistake that we made, and this is the reason that I think so many people have problems around avoidance and, and distraction and procrastination, is that we divorced emotions from the body. So if you look at like kind of the lineage of our, our divisions of knowledge, what we kind of discover is that psychology sort of branched off, right? Even in medicine, for example, psychiatry is separate from the other parts of medicine. And even if we look at things like therapy or psychologists, those people actually aren't trained in the body at all, right? So their, their uh, uh, training is exclusively in the mind. So somewhere along the way in the Western system, we divorced the body from the mind. And so then what started to happen is as we started to frame these problems like avoidance— as a psychological problem, we started to naturally look for psychological solutions, right? Because like, oh, this is like a defense mechanism and going back to Anna Freud and this is avoidance and, oh, it's all like emotional. Like you should go talk to a therapist, right? Go to a therapist's office, sit in a chair for an hour and like talk about your feelings. And if you talk about your feelings, then the problem will be improved or maybe even fixed. And so there's certainly value to all that, but I think we actually missed something really important, which is that emotions are not exclusively in the mind. That's how we sort of think about them. But if you actually look at it, emotions are very much in the body. So let's kind of like go through a little bit of like the evidence behind that. And then we'll talk a little bit about why it's important. So if you think about emotions, they actually have all kinds of physiologic effects. So the first thing to understand is that emotions are essentially kind of preset patterns to deal with particular situations. So once I activate, let's say, like the anger pattern, that's my body and brain's way 
of aligning my whole being to deal with a certain set of things. It's almost like a stance in, in a video game or like a mode of operation, right? I'm going to go into like crane stance and crane stance is very good for dealing with particular things. I'm going to go into anger stance. So anger stance is really good at particular things. So we not only see that anger, for example, encourages black and white thinking. So there's a cognitive aspect to it. Um, anger also speed increases the speed of our thoughts. So we know that there's like cognitive effects. But anger also does all kinds of other things to our body. So for example, it increases our heart rate, increases our blood pressure, reroutes blood to our skeletal muscle. So it sends blood away from our stomach and intestines and liver and sends it towards our arms and legs. And anger also does other kinds of very interesting things. So it reduces the signal from nociceptors. So these are pain receptors. So it dulls our experience of pain, right? So sometimes you'll see this in real life and in movies where someone's in a fight and you don't feel the pain in the middle of the fight, right? You actually feel the pain 15 minutes later, an hour later. Sometimes you'll even have people who are have gunshot wounds and they won't even realize it. And why is that? It's because they their adrenaline is pumping. They're emotionally very, very activated. And it actually has all kinds of physiologic effects. We also see different physiological effects with things like anxiety. So in the case of anxiety, for example, will once again increase heart rate, increase bl blood pressure, you know, but it, there's some things that are different about anxiety. So anxiety, whereas anger dulls pain, anxiety actually enhances it. So we become more sensitive to potential st uh, painful stimuli. And so if you think about someone who's anxious, they're even like sensitive to verbal stimuli, right? They're paying attention to everyone around them. They're saying, okay, like, is this person happy with me? Is this person not happy with me? And even minor things that may be benign will get interpreted by the anxious mind as being harmful. Oh, the reason that this person isn't smiling at me must mean they, they must dislike me. So if you actually look at anxiety, it's kind of interesting because people who experience anxiety, their nociceptors, their pain receptors are actually hyperactive. And the mind is the same way as well. And why is that? It's because anxiety helps us look for danger, right? It helps us see potential signs of danger so that we can sort of prevent them from becoming full-blown crises that we have to deal with. So we can kind of very clearly see that emotions have physical components to them. And it's not just negative emotions, right? So we also know that, for example, the feeling of contentment. So contentment has certain mental uh, cognitive aspects, right? I'm kind of chilling, I'm vibing, I'm enjoying myself. But we also know that there's a lot of activation of, for example, the parasympathetic nervous system when you're feeling contented. We'll even use some techniques of meditation to activate that parasympathetic nervous system kind of artificially. And when we activate it artificially, what that sort of does is induce contentment, right? So we'll even go through physiologic processes, like particular rates of breathing, that will induce a physiologic change, which will result in a mental change. So even the positive uh, uh, emotions that we feel like excitement, curiosity, those will all map on physiologically. And the really cool thing is there's actually research about this as well. Whereas if you look with, uh, look at, um, so this is one paper that I really, really like. So we shared this paper um, a, a month or two ago, but here's a, a paper that what essentially what scientists did is they looked at, they took a bunch of people and they tried to map different emotions onto the body. So they tried to figure out, okay, so if someone's feeling, let's say, um, fear, where does fear exist within the body? And if you look at anger, like I think this is so cool, right? So anger is felt more in the head and more in the hands. Like you can do something with anger. You don't feel fe fear in your hands and feet, right? You feel anger in your hands. Also, if you look at tiredness, right? So tiredness, you kind of feel more peripherally, whereas exhaustion, you feel more centrally, like there's more stuff centrally. And so if you look at like even some of these things like failing feels a little bit different from guilt. So guilt is, is a more simple emotion. When you think about failing, there's like more cognitive involvement with it. Does that kind of make sense? So I think it's really cool because as they look at all of these different emotions, what they sort of figure out is that they map on to different parts of the body. And so the first thing that this is useful for is it can help us identify our emotions, right? So if we don't know, okay, what am I feeling right now? Am I feeling guilty or am I feeling like a failure? Because these will actually result in different physical sensations, Am I feeling disappointment or am I feeling sadness? 
am I feeling disgust or am I feeling disappointed in someone? So it's kind of interesting because if you're trying to figure out how do I feel about, let's say, my best friend when they do something bad to me, do I feel disappointed in them? That's going to be more in the chest. Or do I feel disgusted with them? That's going to actually be more in the belly. And if you kind of like, as I'm saying this, hopefully you can sort of like that resonates, right? Like you kind of know that disgust is like, it's more like makes you want to vomit and disappointment like hurts you in your chest. And so this is kind of interesting because it, it really turns out that emotions are sort of evolutionarily far beyond being simple, cognitive, uh, man, uh, having, it's more than cognitive manifestations, right? It's like all of these physiologic manifestations. And so then the question kind of becomes, okay, fine. Like, so the mind and the body are connected. We have ample evidence of that. Like, but what's the point of that? Like, why do we care that the mind and the body are connected? What is the value of understanding the physiological component of emotions? And this is where there's something really cool about the mind-body connection, which is that it's a two-way street, okay? So there's a, it's really interesting because if you, anytime I feel something, it's going to alter my respiratory rate. Right. So like this is a fun game that we enjoy playing. Right. So this is like, you know, what are the different breathing rates? Uh, what are the different patterns of breathing that I can demonstrate? And what could I be feeling? So there's one breathing rate, right, which is <sighs> that's anger. Right. So it's it's deep, but it's fast versus fear, which is <sighs> also fast, but very shallow. And then there are other kinds of emotions that we can sort of experience, like let's say something like lust. Right. Which is not quite as rapid, right? But still kind of deep, but not too deep, right? So there are all these different patterns of breathing as we engage with these different emotions. And the cool thing is that this is a two-way street. So we also know that, for example, physiologically, if you engage in a particular pattern of breathing, it will actually evoke the emotion, right? So this is the key thing that we've got to understand. So if we're looking at things like avoidance and procrastination, and we understand that these are emotional in nature. And then we understand that the emotions are not just mental. And this is where we kind of fall short, right? Because if we're working on procrastination, we work exclusively on the mind or primarily on the mind. I don't see people talking about exercise as an antidote to procrastination. I don't see people talking about exercise or a particular physical practice as an antidote to avoiding, getting over the avoidance that you have for emailing your professor for an extension. So once we define the problem as cognitive, we define the solutions as cognitive. But this is the really cool thing. Once we understand that emotions actually exist within the body and that this is a two-way street, we actually open the door to tons of solutions for things like procrastination and avoidance that have no amount of mental anything. It's actually going to be physical. So the first good example of this is something like meditation, right? So we know that meditation induces, it's kind of a mental practice that induces physiologic changes. But we also know that, for example, there's a lot of benefit, mental benefit to certain kinds of things like physical activities. So things like exercise, things like relaxation, things like massage, even some of the, the data around things like Reiki or energy healing really demonstrate that these are not these are sort of things like, like if you look at like acupuncture, or acupressure, these are things that we're doing to the body. They're not like psychotherapy, but they tend to have positive effects for both body and mind. Okay. And in the case of energy healing and stuff, we don't see a whole lot of clinical impact, but we see a lot of quality of life changes. So we know that we can work on the body to actually improve the mind and improve our emotions. So here's kind of how I would suggest that people kind of approach this, right? So the first thing to understand is that if you are avoiding or procrastinating in some way, what you really want to do is start by, if you don't know what's going on and you can't figure it out in your head, that's actually totally fine. Start with your body. So as you start to become aware of your body, you'll start to discover, okay, what is it that I'm feeling? Where am I feeling this? Like where in my body do I feel procrastination? Is it my stomach? Is it my head? Is it my chest? Is it a combination of both, right? Because it's not just one place. If we go back to the map, what we realize is there are very, very nuanced emotional representations across our body. And so as you begin to kind of diagnose the emotion, that in and of itself will help a little bit with the avoidance and the procrastination because now you know what you're dealing with. If you think about struggling with avoidance, usually what it is, you don't really know why you're avoiding it, right? Even the thoughts 
of why you're avoiding it is something that you avoid. Because if you think about, and this is the crazy thing, if you think about why you're avoiding something, and you think about, then you start thinking about what's going to happen if you stop avoiding it, right? If I have this conversation with this person, what's going to happen? That gets you emotionally activated. And then you get like, kind of like, oh my God, then I'm going to even avoid thinking about it. And then what I end up doing is going into distraction, right? When we avoid something, we actually try really, really hard to even avoid the avoidance. And so we end up in distraction. So the first thing is to understand, okay, this is an emotion in my body. So let me focus on the body because this is what's kind of interesting, especially if you look at people like men who have normative male alexithymia. So this is the essentially normal experience of men to be emotionally unaware of what they're experiencing. So men don't kind of know what they're feeling, right? So they, they may say, oh, I'm pissed or I'm frustrated, but they have more difficulty like understanding what their emotions are. So you can use your body, especially if you're alexithymic, to sort of discover what you're feeling emotionally. Then the other super, super, super cool thing is remember that the mind-body connection is a two-way street, right? Mental stress or anxiety can cause queasiness of the stomach. So then the question becomes, if I resolve the queasiness of the stomach, what impact does it have on my anxiety? And this is what's really wild, is resolving the physical emotion will induce a mental change, okay? So we understand this really well. I don't know if y'all have seen this, but when people had panic attacks, what we used to recommend is that they breathe into a paper bag. And when someone breathes into a paper bag, essentially what they're doing is they're increasing the level of CO2 that is in the paper bag because you're just breathing in and out, right? As you increase the level of CO2 of the, breath, uh, of the air that you're breathing, it requires you to take a deeper breath because otherwise you're not going to get enough oxygen. As you take deeper breaths, it induces a physiologic change. As it induces a physiologic change, it actually induces a mental change and can at times stave off panic attacks. That particular technique isn't quite as effective as people used to think, but we also know that this is absolutely true of any number of other uh, problematic emotional states. So we know that, for example, there are techniques for people who have uh, like borderline personality disorder that will be very physical in nature that will sort of calm their emotions down. And what this means for you is that if you are avoiding or procrastinating, and that affects both your bo body and mind, if you actually work on the body, it'll actually reduce the procrastination or avoidance. So this is where like if you think about a particular task and you're avoiding doing it, Close your eyes for a moment and check in with your body. What am I feeling in this moment? Where is this feeling? Is it in my stomach? Is it in my chest? Is it in my head? Okay, what is this? Is this shame? Is this disappointment? Is this anger? And then what we're going to do is work on the body. So what can you do? Forget about the task. Forget about the procrastination. Forget about the avoidance. What can you do in this moment that will change the physical sensation that you have? So can you go for a walk? Can you do some deep breathing? You know, you want to steer clear of things like substance use, but that works really well as well. Those are not really worth it. But generally speaking, anything that you can do to change your physical state, even if it's like just sitting down and closing your eyes for a little while, even if it's something like taking a shower, there are all kinds of different things you can do. You can grab a, a hot cup of tea and kind of sit down with it and sip it slowly and just sort of like, you know, really feel the moment and feel those physical sensations. Something really magical will happen, which is that as you start to use your body to digest your internal physical emotions, the mind will actually become relaxed as well. As the mind becomes relaxed, you'll actually be able to engage in behaviors. So the cool thing about understanding procrastination and avoidance is that if we understand the physical impact, the physical element of the emotion that's leading to the avoidance, we can actually work purely on a physical level. And as we work purely on a physical level, it actually can become very easy for some of us who have a lot of mental struggle with things like procrastination and avoidance. And we kind of run into a wall, right? Because we're trying to stop procrastinating, stop procrastinating, stop procrastinating. And where are you fighting that battle? You're fighting it all up here. And then you get into an argument with yourself. But I really need to do this, but I don't want to. I really need to do it. I don't want to. And what ends up happening? It doesn't work. And part of the reason is because we've lost sight of the fact that our emotions actually don't exist just up here. They ex exist all throughout our body. And as we start working on our emotions in our body, what we'll discover is that a lot of the challenges that we face in life will appear to get easier. Questions?
Anyone got questions? Yeah, this is a great question. So can you do this with a workout? Absolutely, you can do this with a workout. So remember that there's evidence, a lot of evidence, that shows that exercise is an effective treatment for things like major depressive disorder and generalized anxiety disorder. So let's just think about that for a second, right? If we consider these disorders to be psychological in nature, how on earth does bench pressing help my mood? Like, what is the connection there? But of course there's a connection there, right? Because my mind and my body are connected. Does, does bench pressing directly impact my shame? Maybe, maybe not. Like, who knows? But we do know from tons of scientific studies that exercise can actually help your mood. Like, duh, right? Like, we kind of know that. But I think what we haven't done is the society has really understood the impact of what that finding tells us. Because what that finding really tells us is that body and mind are not divorced. And here we are trying to solve mental problems with mental gymnastics. And instead, what we should maybe be doing is like physical gymnastics. So working out can absolutely help. Right? Yeah. So War Angel's like bench pressing my emotions. Absolutely, dude. Right? Okay, what if I feel a mental block in my mind? How can you fix a problem that feels like a physical blockage in, in my brain? So this is great. So if you feel a mental blockage in your mind, what I would recommend that you... So it, it just, okay, if you feel a mental blockage in your mind, okay, this is fantastic. I love this question. What do you do if you have a mental block in your, your mind and there's a physical block in the brain? You feel like, I just can't get my hands around. So I want you all to pay attention to your physical form when you feel like you have a mental block in your mind. What are you going to feel in your physical form? The next time you, you think about times in your life where you felt stuck, what is your body like? Your body's like this. You're going to be hunched over. You're going to feel contracted. You're going to feel tight everywhere. Constrained. Right? So I know it sounds really bizarre, but do yoga. Do especially things like yoga and tai chi. Start to move the body, right? Become fluid. And as you become physically fluid, I know it's bizarre. It will help your mind become fluid. That's been my experience, and I've used this as a clinician with tons of people. Where, like, we know that yoga and tai chi have been, there are scientific studies on their impact on things like mental illnesses. And the data is positive. So how the hell does that work? There's all kinds of complex neuroscientific mechanisms. But here's the thing. You don't have to understand the neuroscientific mechanisms. You just have to know that the practice works and then do the practice. So if you're feeling a blockage in your mind, stretch your body. Make it more flexible. It'll free up your mind. It's bizarre. Okay, so someone's saying, I want hot dog. I think I can't do any of this until I quit the 24-7 dopamine binge via Twitch, YouTube, video games, and Reddit. It's a common problem, right? And we'll get to this in a second. We can maybe move on in a second because we're going to talk about the 24-7 dopamine binge. It's a common problem that you're kind of thinking like, oh, I can't start taking care of myself until I quit all the dopamine and the video games, and the YouTube binging. It makes perfect sense, right? I have to fix my life first in order to then fix my life, right? So here's what I'd say. If you're stuck in this 24-hour, 24-7 dopamine binge, I want you to close your eyes and feel your body. Because what you'll discover is that this is not something you do after you quit the dopamine binge. This is going to be the reason, this is going to be the key that lets you quit the dopamine binge. Because why can't you quit, quit it already? It's because you're fighting that battle mentally. That's my whole point, is it's exclusively a mental battle. You're not even using your physical form. In fact, what are you doing with your physical form when you are on a 24-7 dopamine binge? It's going to shit. And no wonder you're stuck. Right? You feel terrible. Like your body like aches in weird ways. You just don't feel good in your body. 
And so I totally get it. Like, I need to get off of the dopamine before I can put my life together. But what I would say, the whole value of this particular thing is that you can use your body here and now. And just think about this. Like, if you get up and you stretch or you go for a walk and you're in the middle of your week-long dopamine binge, what do you think happens in the next hour? Right? If you just sit there, what's going to happen in the next hour is the same thing that happened in the hour before. But to have any chance to turn things around, you need to get up and move. Start to utilize your body to control your mind. This is the whole premise of Hatha Yoga, which sort of posits that physical postures or asana can get you all the way to enlightenment. You actually don't need to meditate a single moment and you can still become enlightened. All through purity and perfection of like physical practice. So I'm with you. Like I, I thought the same way, but my whole point is that actually it's the opposite. That physical movement is going to be the way you break free of the dopamine binge. <laughs> Taijutsu is greater than Genjutsu. Where are my Naruto weebs at? Is there any dopamine medication? Absolutely, man. Carvidopa and levodopa. We use it in Parkinson's disease. Because dopamine does way more than provide enjoyment. <laughs> Naruto. Yeah. So, so okay. I know y'all are memeing, right? So Draco V333 is saying Naruto running intensifies. Okay, let me ask y'all a question. What is the correlation between Naruto running and accomplishment? Are the Naruto runners who are very, very intense, are they the ones that actually accomplish the most or accomplish the least? What you will discover is that accomplishment correlates directly with the, the intensity of the Naruto running, right? It's like, even if you think about the third Hokage, when does he start actually doing? I mean, most of the time he's just standing around. But when he starts Naruto running, it's like, oh my God, shit's happening now. Right? So like, this is the thing. Like when, when we discover something that's scientifically true, it's even to be found within Naruto memes. Right? And like, like, let's take a look at a couple of other things, like Orochimaru, okay? Let's just do a quick analysis of Orochimaru. Orochimaru doesn't do any Naruto running. He just stands around looking sinister. And look at what happens to him. No spoilers. Right? And meanwhile, we've got a bunch of people who are Naruto running. So, you know, like, there's plenty of evidence. Right? Oh, like all these, like, Uchiha folks, right? With all their Mangekyo Sharingan standing around doing shit. And look at what happens to them. Right? It's the Naruto runners. You know, Rock Lee is the one who's taking care of things. <laughs> all right. Enough of that madness. Okay, give me a second. I got to grab some water. We're going to do a quick chair stream. And then we'll talk a little bit more about... You guys just meditate on the Naruto running. I need some more water. I'll be right back. Do you guys want me to change the screen or y'all want to use the chair stream? Chair stream. Okay. Water and chair stream. Here, here we go. Okay.
Give me just a second, chat. Okay. Should we talk a little bit about emotional processing? Hmm? <laughs> okay. Um, I was noticing that I was feeling not great in my body there for a second. So I'm going to change my posture because it helps me, okay? All right, let me go down a little bit more. There we go. Anime psychology analysis when I think we just did it. <laughs> okay. So let's talk a little bit about emotional processing. So I want to start with a story. So I was w once working with someone who was in the field of finance. And they came to my office and they were concerned that they were going to get fired. And so they were say they came in and they said, I'm really anxious. And I said, okay, well, what are you anxious about? They said, well, I'm paranoid I'm going to get fired. And so we, as we kind of dug into it, what we found is that, you know, this person's anxiety was sort of turning into a vicious cycle where they were, you know, they were afraid that they were going to get fired, which in turn means that anytime they were presenting— so they'd, once a week, they would kind of present to all the partners and stuff like that about the work that they were doing, the deals they were, were working on, things like that. And so the more anxious they became, like, the more they would stumble over their words, like, oh, my God, like, the partners are all listening, like, oh, like, I can't screw this up, I can't screw this up. And since their mind is not on what they're actually supposed to be presenting, but is so focused on not wanting to screw everything up, what would happen? They would screw up. Right? They would stumble over their words. Their, their presentation wouldn't kind of come out clear. And so they were just really concerned and terrified. And they just had to get a control of this anxiety. So they kind of came to my office and they're like, you know, can you help me like with the anxiety? And so we talked about lots of different stuff. And it was really interesting what ended up happening. We'll s sort of share what, what happens at the end of our talk today. But so we started working on that. And I think one of the key things that I, I sort of noticed as I was talking to him is that things seem to be getting harder, right? If we kind of look at people today, like I talk to a lot of people and it just seems like things are just getting harder. I get the sense that we're getting more kind of wrung out, right? As we go through life, I'll talk to people who are teenagers in their 20s and their 30s. Like life seems to just be squeezing everyone dry. And even if you look at some of these like things like the, the kind of anti-work movement or dating, like life, there just seems to be like more suffering. Like, I get the sense that people today are going through life trying to take as little damage as possible. Because every time you, like, do something in your life, like, it's not going to go well and you're going to, like, lose a piece of yourself. Like, in online dating, for example, everyone's like, every single date I go on, it's like, I lose, like, this tiny part of myself, right? Like, I went on another date. I dug real deep. I, you know, matched with 5,000 people. I went on one date and with things didn't really work out. And now it's like, am I going to be alone forever? And so it's kind of like life just, the more you go through life, the more like battered and bruised you get. And there's this kind of idea that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. But I get the sense that when I talk to people, like they're just getting kind of, it's like death by a thousand cuts. As they try to move through life, they're just getting more and more shriveled and kind of patched up and defunct. And like, it just, it just seems like we're not able to recover from things the way that we used to, Right. And so I was kind of thinking about this because is life actually getting worse? Like, you know, if we look at it, humanity is advancing in so many different ways. Hopefully we'll have human beings on Mars soon. You know, medicine is advancing. Technology is advancing. Like we have commercial flights into space now. Like, you know, we have cell phones, right? So we can do all kinds of stuff. Like video games are super cool. There's like VR technology. We developed a COVID vaccine in two years. You know, like cancer treatments are improving. Like... If you look around, like things seem to be getting better, right? If you look at the humanity is progressing. But why does it feel like we're getting worse, right? Why is humanity as a whole progressing? But it feels like every person I talk to 
who's trying to go through life is just getting like worse and worse, right? It almost feels like you start life with some amount of happiness and each negative experience you have like takes away some happiness and it's never to be gained again. I get the sense of, of a very limited resource that people are kind of like getting rid of as they try to go through life. And so I think we have some terms uh, like burnout, for example, which is at an all time high. So why are like so many people burnt out when we have so many things that make our life convenient? So if we think about what used to, what, what should burn us out, like what should burn us out? It's like, you know, effort. But now I can get food delivered to my door. I don't have to have to sit up to work or be entertained. Like I can now do all my work or entertainment at my fingertips. You know, I can watch Breaking Bad on the toilet if I want to. Like there's all kinds of stuff. I can, I can take off my switch off the dock and, and, you know, walk into the bathtub and then like play switch. Like there's so much convenience. I think it should be getting easier. But it feels like things are getting harder. And so if we want to understand, okay, like what's going on here? So are we just wrong? Are we like, you know, some of the people from the older generation are like young kids nowadays. They're so ungrateful. They are so lazy. Like, you know, is that what's going on? Is, is, is generation, have we just gotten kind of, you know, lazy? Like what's, what's happening here? What's changed? Has anything changed? Is this just a perception? And what I kind of realized is that the world that we lived in is not the world in which our brains were developed, right? So our brains evolved for a particular kind of lifestyle. And I think what we're actually seeing is that as humanity has progressed a lot, we've lost sight of like particular things that our brain used to rely on, took for granted so easily that now that we sort of lost it, we're kind of really confused about what we even lost because we weren't even aware of it. And in essence, I think that's emotional processing. And as a society, what we've lost sight of is the ability to emotionally process. In fact, it was so easy to do before that we don't even think about it necessarily like a skill, right? Like we kind of took it for granted because now we have all these like resources around emotional processing, right? Go see a therapist. But like 10,000 years ago or 20,000 years ago, there weren't therapists and it's not, not like human beings were having trouble with emotional processing, right? They were just kind of going about and living their lives. So I want to share with y'all uh, an interesting perspective from like evolutionary psychology around how the brain processes emotions. And what we will discover is, okay, once we understand how the brain processes emotions, we'll see how society has changed. And if we see how society has changed, we'll maybe be able to detect, have we lost the ability to process emotions? And then the question kind of becomes, okay, if we figured out that we have lost the ability to process emotions, what can we start to do differently? How can we reclaim the lives that we used to have so that emotional processing becomes easier? Okay, so let's start with kind of how society used to exist. So the first thing is that we used to live in communal groups, right? So there's like a group of people. And so there was a limited amount of stuff to get you excited on a daily basis. There was like a lit, like the scope of conflict was like narrow, right? You maybe live in a village of, let's say, somewhere between like 50 and 500 people. And so you, there are only so many people you can have beef with. Whereas like now, if you look at the world today, like I can post something on Twitter and the 10,000 people that disagree very strongly with what I said can attack me on Twitter from all across the globe. Even though it's a tiny fraction of the world, right? They can still pile on and attack me. So the first thing to understand is that we used to live in kind of a communal society. And if you look at how human beings managed conflict, so let's say, look, we have some kind of conflict, and then, like, what would happen after the conflict? Let's say I get into an argument with someone in my town or in my tribal group, okay? What happens after that emotional exchange? So I'm kind of ramped up emotionally, right? Like, what do I do? So let's say I go, like, out foraging. And so I'm walking through the wilderness, and I'm sort of physically paying attention to things. But mentally, like, what am I doing? Like, I'm just sort of like, my mind is kind of doesn't have anything to do, right? And so our, my mind is kind of in idle mode. Like, there's not, I'm not engaged in an argument then, but I have lots of time where my mind is idle and I'm sort of doing some physical things. We also see this with humans in terms of rote labor, right? So we, humans used to do a lot of like rote labor that was mentally like idle. So let's say I'm repairing fishing nets or, you know, I'm, I'm, making a fire, right, which used to be like an hour-long endeavor, 
or I'm like sharpening a spear or I'm maintaining, I'm tanning leather or something like that. Like there's all kinds of like tasks that human beings used to do all the time, which required physical effort, but essentially gave idle time for the mind. And what's kind of interesting about that is if you allow yourself to have idle time in your own mind, what you'll discover is that that's when you actually do a lot of processing. Right? So if I have a conflict with someone and then I go for a walk and I give my mind the chance to think through it, I'll sort of feel better at the end of the walk. Or in a communal society, maybe I'll go for a walk with a friend or I'll go foraging right, with a group of people. And then we kind of talk a little bit about what happened and then I'll kind of like process it. Even in terms of the rote labor, where like if I'm sitting there repairing fishing nets and I had a conflict with my, let's say, wife last night, that's a good chance for me to kind of like think through things. And so one of the key things is I kind of look at really study. I remember reading about anthropology and some of these, you know, tribes in New Guinea and sort of the psychological impact or their, what their psychological lives were like. And I was struck by the amount of idle time that they have to essentially like process stuff because there's nothing else to do. And now if we kind of think about it, how is modern life different? And what we discover about modern life is that we essentially have no time to process. That processing is actually like a subconscious or relatively automatic activity that, that happens over long periods of time. So we sort of know this, right? So there are some theories in psychiatry about dreams and stuff as methods of emotional processing that essentially like a lot of these thoughts and stuff will be active in our unconscious. But we sort of know that, that emotional processing to a certain degree like takes time and takes like space. And if we really look at what's changed in our society, it's been a loss of time and space because we don't have idle time anymore, right? Now when I'm taking a walk, what am I doing? I'm listening to an audiobook, listening to a podcast, listening to music. Now when I have a conflict with someone, what happens? Do I go for a walk afterward? Do, do I have time to think about it while I'm repairing my nets? No, of course not. I create mental distraction. So what we're starting to see is that as we accumulate these negative experiences, let's say I have a bad date. What I end up doing immediately after the bad date, it's not like I've got idle time in my mind. In fact, what I want to do is distract myself. And then what happens is as I distract myself, I don't process any of those emotions. They kind of just go dormant, right? Because after a bad date, you kind of want to like distract yourself from those emotions. But then when you wake up the next morning, what's waiting for you? What's waiting for you is those emotions. And so the second you wake up, you're like, oh my God, like that date was so terrible. And then what do you do? You pull out your phone and you distract yourself from that processing in the moment. And as this goes on again and again and again, what we tend to see is that our life is filled with negative impacts that we don't allow ourselves time to actually process. And even in the history of humanity, we have some events like funerals are a good example of this, where we sort of have active participation without any sort of intellectual goal. Does that kind of make sense? Like when I go to a funeral, it's not like we're there to do anything. We just kind of communally gather and we just sort of share random thoughts about the person and something about that experience. It's not like we're there and we're going to be like, okay, what are the 16 ways in which this person impacted your life? Let's think through them. Let's think about how you're going to replace each of these things that this person did for you. That's not actually what funerals do for us. That's not how they help us process grief, right? They just sort of create this like time and space that sort of has this, this intensive participation without actually a whole lot of like mental work. And so our mind is allowed to almost be on autopilot and sort of process that grief in these funeral kind of situations. And if we look at life, essentially what we've lost is all of that kind of time because now we're doing something constantly. We'll also, this is also why I think that memes are so telling, right? Because if after I've been through traumatic dating experiences, why do I love the memes that I love? And I think the reason we love the memes that we love is because we've got so much buried emotion that it takes some kind of humorous single image to evoke that emotion. And it resonates with us, right? That's why we love memes. So I don't even think it's a coincidence that we've seen a rise in memes correlating with the lack of emotional processing. And the more we love memes, because it speaks to what we struggle with in life, right? Because those things are things that we hold on to. We have all these negative experiences. Each date that I go on, each time I send out a job application in this massive pool, each time that someone gets back to me 
after I've applied to a job and they're like, hey, can you upload your resume into our specific portal and retype everything? And it's like, that's why I sent a resume, right? Each of these tiny little traumatic experiences we have, and then what do we do as soon as I'm done uploading my resume into the 16th, you know, corporate portal because they want it formatted in their way? What do I do after 16 of those? I'm so exhausted that I'm going to go play a video game. I sure as hell ain't going to stop and think about it, right? I'm not going to like be idle. I need to get the hell away from this. And so our society has given us so much space to distract ourselves from our emotions that we never end up processing them. And this is why it feels like as we go through life, we lose a piece of ourself with each negative experience. Because we do lose a piece of ourself. The difference is that in the past, we knew how to find those pieces. We could get them back because we had this process of kind of emotional healing. And the lack of this also kind of explains some of these like emotional interactions and some of these things like trauma dumping on the internet, where like now I've got this like gigantic pile of emotion that subsurface has been buried down with dopaminergic distraction. And then occasionally I'll like explode on someone on the internet. Or we'll see people who get really, really caught up, right? Or very, very angry. We'll see so much tilt and anger on the internet. Why is that? It's because none of this stuff gets processed. And sometimes what happens is people will go and they'll like vomit in some corner of the internet, right? They'll make some rant. But even if you think about the rant, what happens to that person after they type out their rant? They just go back to the distraction. So what we're almost seeing is like these surface level emotional managements. It's not like that person is getting to the root of the issue, right? They're just ranting for a little while, and then they go do something else, and then the emotions pile up again, and then they kind of like overflow and rant again. So what we're seeing is that our society, this sort of natural emotional processing, has been replaced by this very like surface level distraction, and sometimes even this like verbal diarrhea kind of stuff, which we call like venting. But venting is not the same as emotional processing. All it does is get rid of the stuff on top. And then what we really have to think a little bit about is, okay, so like, what do we do about the stuff down below? How do we actually process our emotions and start to feel a little bit better about life? How do we recover from the damage that has been done? And that's where I think that what we've really lost sight of is some of this deeper emotional work. And if we think a little bit about the deeper emotional work, what are the attributes of it, right? So the first is that it requires time. The second is it requires space. The third is it requires something like exploration. And so what we've managed to actually do is create a system of professionals that in a certain amount of, in a restricted time and in a restricted space can go deeper than you normally would, right? These are what we call therapists. In the case, there are even other kinds of professionals, right? Like coaches. And if we think about life coaches or, or career coaches or things like that, like we have a pretty robust coaching program. What we've really found is that coaches are really good at understanding those kinds of problems and then helping you do that emotional work so that you can actually like move forward and achieve your goals. Which going back to our original case at the beginning, so here's just a prime example of that, right? So this is a person who came in and was really, really concerned about losing their job. And so what ended up happening is we talked about it. They're like, okay, like, well, why are you so stressed out about losing your job? And what they sort of told me is that, you know, I'm really a team player. Like, I like working on teams. Um, they were a professional athlete and had done a lot of team-oriented sports. And so that what they were really looking for is like a team. And what they really hated the most, the root of all their problems at this particular uh, financial institution, was that it was like really competitive. It was sort of like a dog-eat-dog -dog kind of world, right? So what would happen is... If they were working on a deal with a couple of colleagues, the colleagues would try to make themselves look good by like taking the credit. And as they started taking more and more credit, the person I was working with started to feel really, really anxious because now they're losing credit for their work. People are going to think that they're a waste of space. People are thinking that they're not carrying their weight and that triggers all the anxiety. And then they're afraid they're going to get fired. And why are they going to get fired? It's because they can't advocate themselves for themselves in a room the way that other people can, right? They can't sort of like take all the credit because that's just not who they are. They're like a team person, not like a competitive, like I'm going to, you know, take everybody else's credit. And so 18 months after this person came into my office requesting help with anxiety so that they wouldn't get fired, they actually decided to quit. And this is exactly the value of emotional processing. Once you start to figure out, we have these surface level emotions that we deal with. 
But once you actually start to do that deep emotional work, you start to figure out, okay, what is it that I dislike about this place? How are these experiences actually affecting me? How are these experiences changing the way that I look at myself? How do I want to look at myself? How do I want to live in this world? What kind of stuff do I actually want? And once we start to do that deep emotional work and once we actually figure out, okay, this is deeply how I feel about it. Once I give myself time and space and keep in mind that this person worked with a professional for 18 months to get there. Discover what you actually want. Process each of those events and how they made you feel about yourself. And then ultimately what you're going to be able to do is quit. You'll be able to be free of it. You'll be able to actually manufacture your own destiny. You'll be able to actually make decisions that are aligned with who you are. But we've lost sight of who we are because we're so busy distracting ourselves and having these emotional volcanic eruptions without ever actually getting to the root of it. So people may be wondering, okay, practically, like, what does this entail, right? How do I do this? This sounds great. So let's remember that there are a couple of things that if we kind of look at anthropology, we can sort of look at what human beings used to do to process. And we can try to create those in a sort of targeted way. So the, thing, the first thing, at the, uh, you know, at the top of my list is journaling. And journaling is a little bit tricky because people will say like, oh, like you should journal. But then I don't know if y'all are like this. I'm kind of like this where I didn't know how to journal because everyone says you should journal, but no one teaches you how to journal, right? Because even journals are like private. It's not like if I started journaling at the age of 12, no one's supposed to read it. So how am I supposed to get feedback on whether I'm journaling properly or improperly? And that's where some people say there's no proper way to journal. It's for you. But this is what's really frustrating is if you're kind of like me, where you're kind of like a logical, scientific person, if people are in touch with their feelings, they can figure out how to journal on their own. But I don't know how to journal. I need like, I need to understand what's the point. What am I trying to do? Like, and they're like, that's not the point of journaling. No, BS. It can be the point of journaling, right? So it's, it's, no one teaches us how to journal. So I'd love to do it with you all today is just teach you a little bit about journaling. So there are a couple of different ways you can journal. The first is that you can write about experiences that are emotionally charged for you. This is the simplest way to journal. And the cool thing about journaling is that it doesn't have a particular endpoint, right? So when you say, well, what am I supposed to write about? You know, how do I know when I'm done? Well, it kind of doesn't matter. Because the journaling itself, it's not about doing the journaling the right way or the wrong way. It's that the journaling is going to be a substitute for that sort of idle work and giving your mind time to start processing. And then your mind will do the subconscious processing on its own. So I would say just write about experiences that are emotionally engaging for you. And what does that mean, emotionally engaging? It means things that made you feel good or feel bad. Now, sometimes people may be kind of confused and they're like, okay, but like, I don't want to journal about that, right? So sometimes people run into resistance around journaling around emotionally active experiences, which makes perfect sense because they're emotionally engaging. And sometimes we try to avoid that crap. And since we avoid, we want to avoid that crap, that's how we end up in the dopaminergic crap. Right? That's how we end up in video games and social media and Twitter and Reddit and memes because we're trying to avoid it. So then the other thing that you can do, if that's even too emotionally charged for you, you can write about what happened today or this week. You can just jot down thoughts that you have, things that you want to think about, things that you want to jot down. Right, And you may say, but, but then what's the point of that? Like, I don't need to recap what happened this week or what happened today. That doesn't do me any good. And that's where, once again, I think you're kind of missing the point, which is that the goal is not cognitive. The goal is not to logically decide at the end, like pros and cons lists. That's not what the goal is. The goal is to actually remember what we're missing in society is time and space. Idle time for our mind to like kind of digest what's happened to us. So all you need to do is engage in some kind of activity that gives your mind that time and space. It actually doesn't need to be very goal-oriented. So you can write about emotional experiences, you can write about your day, you can jot down thoughts or ideas or things that you're interested in, All right? So sometimes I'll, when I journal, I'll kind of make notes about philosophy or science or what I think is wrong with the world. And all of those things can be incredibly productive because what we're really trying to do is give our mind some more of that time and space to actually do that deep emotional work, which it'll do on, on its own. You don't have to speed it along. Now, a couple of other things that people will do to sort of help with emotional processing. So you can, of course, work with a professional. So especially depending on the kind of processing you're trying to do, I'd say a therapist is a really good idea. If you're the kind of processing you're trying to do is to try to figure out, okay, what do I want to do with my life 
Am I looking for direction or am I looking to unburden myself from the past? If your primary goal is to unburden yourself from the past, I definitely recommend therapy. If your goal is to try to figure out what you want from this life, I think coaching or spirituality is actually like a better fit. So there are other things that I think are really, really conducive to this. So remember that the requirements that our ancestors used were sort of rote physical activity with mental idle time. So any activity like that, I think will sort of help you emotionally process. So my personal take is like, I love hiking. And we sort of know this, right? We know that when people go hiking for three months in the mountains, they come back as different human beings, right? Like they're like, they know what they want from life. They like found themselves in, in you know, the Himalayas after a six month hike. And they like just become different people. And if you kind of think a little bit about that, well, hold on a second, how does that work? Well, essentially what they did is gave themselves a, a steroid shot of emotional processing. They gave themselves so much idle time and physical activity that they processed a bunch of stuff. And it all happened somewhat subconsciously that they come back as transformed people. So nature, I think, it absolutely helps. But it's really those couple of components that you have to have some amount of physical demand with mental idleness without a clear mental goal, because that's not really emotional processing. So these are a couple of tips that I'd really suggest if you're someone who feels like going through life just takes more and more out of you. What I've really found is that people really struggle with this because every experience becomes, has to be perfect because you can't afford the loss. Does that make sense? Like you, you, you can't waste your life dating this one person because if you've wasted two years on this person, what are you going to like, that's, those two years are gone and you're never going to be able to get them back. And we've lost the ability to recover from our injuries in life, which is part of the reason that we've become so miserly with actually making commitments, right? And if I can't recover from the emotional damage, if I'm going to be traumatized by dating this person, I have to be so much more hesitant to date them in the first place. As I become hesitant to date them in the first place, I stop actually living life because I'm afraid of making mistakes. And so I think what we've really lost more than anything else is the ability to emotionally process. And as we get little pieces of our soul clipped away by the experiences of life, and as we turn to technology, we, we don't really allow ourselves to heal and recover from it because te technology is so good at distracting. And so if you find yourself in this kind of situation, I'd strongly recommend you take a look at emotional processing. You start to do some of these activities like journal or meditate or go see a therapist or coach. Or if you've got the time, go find yourself in the Himalayas for six months. Like, that's fantastic. Go do that. But in the absence of that, hopefully this has been a little bit helpful. And if you want to start somewhere, start with journaling. Questions? <laughs> yeah, so this is a great point. So um, we also can't afford the loss because we already have so much emotional burden and we're trying to avoid as much as possible to have an any bit more of it. That's beautifully said. Right? Our trash can is so full of emotional experiences that we can't, we can't open up any other packaging because we've got no space in the trash. So we're already like up to here with emotional burdens. So now we can't even engage in anything else because we've got no room for anything else. We can't afford to be hurt or damaged or disappointed in any way. And so we stop living life right? Because you can't afford to take any more losses. So stop playing the game. And that's the real tragedy is we've completely forgotten. All we know how to do is like make withdrawals. We've completely forgotten how to make deposits. Can I trash the journal afterwards? Reading what I write down afterwards stresses me out. Absolutely. You can absolutely trash it. Remember, the goal of the journal is to give your mind some kind of framework to start just writing crap out. And the real action is going to be subconscious. There is value to going back and reading your journal entries. But I want you all to notice, so can I trash the journal afterwards? Reading what I write down afterwards stresses me out. So think about that for a second. Like, what the fuck, man? Why does reading your journal stress you out? Think about, like, what, what does that evoke? You'll get that. Like, if reading your journal stresses you out, this is absolutely a problem for you. This signals to me that you are so full of emotional, like, pollution 
that even the thought of reading what you write is stressful. That creates more pollution. Like, that's bizarre, right? So sometimes we get to this point where it's kind of like when you, you know, when you run, run out of money and you get dinged with an overdraft fee. So it's like, by the way, you've got zero dollars. Now you've got minus $45. And each time you make a withdrawal, it dings an overdraft fee. So sometimes we can get so empty that one dollar of emotional injury actually incurs this overdraft penalty. And we're, we now owe $46 of like emotional repayment. And if reading your journal stresses you out, I think this is the kind of situation you're in. So you don't have to read it, by the way. But I'd say start by writing it and burn it. That can be cathartic. Right? Burn it. My heart goes out to you, my friend. So someone's saying it bores me. What does that mean? So that's a prime example of what the problem is. Because we've lost the ability to be mentally idle. Right? We have to have this stuff. Otherwise, we can't function. I can't do things that are boring. So essentially, what, his, what our society has lost, we've gained lots of things. What we've lost is boredom. We've lost rote activities with mental idle time, which is what we call boredom. Right? Doing the dishes is boring. Repairing my fishing nets is boring. Gardening is boring. But then something magical can happen if you start to do it. Gardening can become pleasant. You feel better afterward. Doing the dishes can clean your mind. But we've gotten so unfamiliar with it that it starts to frighten us and we can't tolerate it anymore. Yeah, so there's a lot of advantages to rereading what you journal. So the first thing that I like about rereading your journal is that, so I don't know how to say this, but you can't analyze something and create something at the same time. And oftentimes writer's block is a prime example of analyzing and creating at the same time. So if y'all like sit down, right, and you're trying to write, let's say you're trying to write fiction, and you think about a sentence, but the sentence isn't good enough. So you're kind of being critical of the sentence as it's being, you know, produced. Then you stall because you can't actually put anything on the page. And then you're kind of stuck. So, you know, the right way to write or what a lot of people will recommend is like make a first draft and then go through and, and true masterpieces are not created through writing. They're created through editing. And so the key principle there is that when you journal and you reread it, you will be able to analyze things and discover things that you wouldn't have known when you jotted it down. And then you have people like therapists who are specially trained and helping people with that process, right? So you just talk about your life and they're paying attention and they start to string things together. And then they're going to give it back to you. And as they repeat back to you what you say, you will be able to reflect on it. What about cleaning the bathroom? That's disgusting. So I understand that the bathroom is where we, you know, urinate and defecate. But if you really think about it, it's one of the cleanest rooms in the house, right? It gets like pretty extensively cleaned. I mean, hopefully, hopefully <laughs> on a regular basis. It's like quite sterile. <laughs> but if it isn't, it can be absolutely nasty. Maybe I'm misreading my audience. Yeah, if you've got four kids, you got to teach them to clean. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so... Someone saying the bathroom is a metaphor for the mind. So if the bathroom is a metaphor for the mind, 
we always use the bathroom and we never flush because we dislike the flushing so much, we're just going to distract ourselves from it. So I'm going to go in there, do the absolute what is necessary, and then I'm going to flee as quickly as possible because it's so nasty, and I'm going to go to the internet where I'm going to get some kind of dopaminergic hit that will help me forget about how nasty the bathroom is. And the next day when I need to use it, I'm going to go back in there and I'm going to use it. I'm going to escape as quickly as possible. That's our problem. It's great. It's like a toilet that we never flush. And then what happens is it gets clogged. So then you have to use a plunger and that's even nastier, right? As you stick the plunger inside, now you're like messing with it. And that's why people like turn to drugs instead of going to see therapists. Because when you see a therapist, they're going to clean that shit out. I guess pun intended there. <laughs> okay, for those of you that are eating, come on now. What did y'all expect? Okay, uh, I see there are some questions about what processing is. We'll go into more detail, I think. I, we're, I'm still doing some scientific research on that. No, no, like not, I'm not doing like studies. I'm still going through a bunch of papers about the nature of emotional processing, and we'll give you all something more about this. Yeah, so that's the hard thing, right? So there are some things in life that we can, so everyone's saying, call the plumber. So this is unfortunate, but when it comes to your own mind, that is the one thing that it's been basically impossible for us to completely outsource. It's one of the things that you have to do the work for. You can get a lot of help, but ultimately you've got to do the work. Okay. Okay. Wow, it's so bright. Okay. Give me a second, chat. I'm gonna drink some water. Okay. Uh, no, we're about to talk about stress and money. You all want to talk about stress and money? Let's do it. Do people not drink water? Okay. <laughs> the stress of too much money? I wish. I wish that was a talk that I could give to you all. Eh, the stress of having to... I have so much money, oh my god. My bank account is so heavy when I carry it around on my phone. Oh, the, the account, the numbers are too big. There's so, so much of a strain on my eyes. There's so many digits. So stressful. I can't count that high. It gives me anxiety every time I look at the bank account. <laughs> look at the fucking... <laughs> First world problems. My cell phone screen isn't big enough for the words, all the numbers and the digits on my bank account to fit. I have to turn it sideways like an uncivilized person. Oh my God. I wish. Okay. Um. <laughs> I have to turn it sideways. Let me, oh, all right. So a lot of people wonder about whether money buys happiness or not, 
right? There's kind of this age-old debate of does money buy happiness? And there's even been some research on this stuff, right? Where people are kind of like, uh, I think there was a very famous, there's a very famous like happiness course at Yale that cites some of these studies that essentially what psychologists who look at happiness have discovered is that if you make like between 100 and 150K a year, I think the number was 100K, but I think there's been inflation, that money does buy happiness, but up to a certain point. And that beyond a certain point of money, we, it actually doesn't correlate with increased happiness at all. And so we sort of know, right, so now based on this like new scientific research that, duh, to a certain degree, money buys happiness. But on the flip side, we also know that there are these like spiritual traditions with people like monks, right, and yogis. And these are people that will sort of say like, yeah, you know, these are like, these are the people that their job is to try to become happy. Like that's what enlightenment is, right? It's this like mythical state of like permanent happiness, nirvana, anand, bliss. And they cultivate that state. And apparently the way that you do that is not by acquiring money, but actually by disacquiring money, by actively getting rid of all of your stuff. So we have these monks who are sitting there meditating all the time. And they're apparently the ones that are like the closest to becoming perfectly happy. And so then we're kind of stuck, right? Because it's like, okay, so wait, hold on a second. But which one should I do? Like, I want to be happy in life. So what do I do? Do I grind for money? Do I try to make $100,000 a year? Do I make $150,000 a year? Or do I become a, like a monk? Like, should I learn how to settle, right? So should I learn to like be happy with what I have? Or should I try to get more? And if you say I should be like a monk, but hold on a second, because there's all these researchers that say I need to make 100 to 150K a year. They say that that's what's going to make me happy. So we don't know, right? We don't know. Like, should I chase money or should I not chase money? I want to be happy, but which one is it? And then, then we run into this other problem, which is that, okay, if we decide that, all right, so let's say like, we're going to listen to the Yale researchers, right? Because it's Yale and they're brilliant. And they say 100K a year. Okay, cool. So then the question is, all right, so if I need to make 100K a year to be happy, should I major in something that makes me miserable so that I can get make money? Because that's what everyone tells me to do. And then we enter into this other debate, which is like passion. Or do I major in STEM? Do I like become an artist? And do I make like video games or board games? Or do I like get a job that provides like security and money? Like do I major in computer science or electrical engineering or chemical engineering? So which is it, right? So, okay, hold on a second. So if you're saying that I need 100K to be happy, let me live... Uh, let me major in something that's going to get me a good job. And once I have lots of money, I'll be happy, right? So then that, you sort of go down that path, but people don't seem happy doing that. And now you're kind of confused because then you like kind of go back to the monk thing and it's like, okay, is I, if I'm studying in engineering, should I change majors or should I push through it, right? And eventually happiness will come. So we all get tangled up around this business of, okay, should I try to be a monk? Or should I grind to become happy? Should I make lots of money and then like that'll kind of buy me happiness? Like which one, which one should I do? And the interesting thing is that I don't think that these two paths are actually different at all. In fact, I think what, what I'd love to share with you all today is as we understand the nature of happiness, stress, we understand what money does for us and what it doesn't do for us. And furthermore, once we understand what monks actually do when they meditate, what we'll actually discover is that this problem of, okay, should I major in something that I dislike? Should I pick a career because it makes me money? Or should I do what I love? Should I go the monk route and move away from material possessions? Or should I try to make a bunch of money because that'll make me happy? What we'll actually discover is that it's neither, or, they're, both, they're all the same. There's actually one path. There's actually no discrepancy or disagreement between the monk and the happiness researchers. So let's start by understanding a little bit around, about stress. So the first thing that we've got to understand is that when we're stressed out, it has all kinds of different effects on our body and our mind. So we know that when we're stressed out, our body will secrete different kinds of hormones or chemicals, right? So we'll release things like adrenaline, we'll release things like cortisol. And what cortisol does to our body and our brain is quite diverse. So it'll do things like make us more sensitive to stimuli. So this is a huge thing that cortisol does. So for example, cortisol travels to this part of our brain called the reticular activating formation, which governs how we sleep and how deeply we sleep. And it basically activates some so that smaller noises will wake us up. Okay? So like when we have cortisol in our system, our sleep is light. We don't get deep restful sleep. 
But it's not just that kind of stimulus that it makes us sensitive to. Cortisol also increases the sensitivity of our pain receptors. So things will hurt more when we're in a high stressful state. Emotions will hurt more. Physical injuries will hurt more. We also know that, for example, autoimmune conditions like eczema, asthma, psoriasis, arthritis, all of these things will flare up and will become more active when we are stressed out. We also know that cortisol, for example, makes a lot of our input, so our eyes, our ears, things like that, a lot of our sensory organs will become hypersensitive as well. Because the goal of cortisol is not to keep us alive for the moment, it's to help us stay alive over a 24 or 48 hour period. So the classic example of when cortisol is released is if I run into, let's say, a tiger in the woods, and then I run away from the tiger, that's usually governed by adrenaline. But once I get away from the tiger, for a long period of time, I need to stay alert. And that's essentially what cortisol does. And what cortisol does is sacrifices long-term health for short-term survival. So now we live in a society where cortisol can almost be like constantly flowing through our system. Because in the past, when we were hunter-gatherers, it wasn't that big of a deal because, you know, we'd run into a tiger every now and then. But now what's happening is like when, when the first of the month rolls around and I pay my rent, I'm already worrying about how to pay my rent at the end of the month. So I'm in this constant stress state. As I increase this amount of stress, I start to worry more. I become sensitive to negative stimuli. I have difficulty sleeping. I kind of feel bad, right? So this is what stress does to us. It makes it very hard to be happy when we're in a stressful state because I'm not sleeping. I'm sensitive to pain stimuli. I'm worrying all the time. The mind of someone who has a bunch of cortisol in their system is also looking into the future, so I can't enjoy the present, right? I just paid my rent on the first of the month, and I'm already worrying about the 30th of the month. How am I going to make my rent next month? So I can't even enjoy the 29 days that I have to pay rent. So we start to see that from a physiologic and psychologic standpoint, stress and a lack of happiness are correlated. So what does that have to do with our discussion? Aren't we talking about money and happiness? Well, let's try to understand what 100K buys us or what 150K buys us. Because we know that this seems to be the magic number. And if you think about what 100 to 150K buys you that 200K, 300K, or 400K don't, or that 50K, 60K, or 70K don't, right? Why is this number magical? The number is magical because that amount of money buys us security. So I don't have to worry about paying my rent, usually. If I get sick, I can afford to pay my bills. I can afford food. If my car breaks down, I can probably get it fixed. I may be able to travel some. I may be able to do some amount of enjoyment. I may be able to do some kind of recreation. I'm allowed to have sort of recreational experiences at 100 to 150K. So if we really look at what's magical about that number, what it really provides for us is security. What it really does is that's the amount of money that we need to lower our cortisol levels. Right? Because now I'm not stressed about making unless I'm overextended and stuff like that. And you all may know people who make 150K who are stressed out of their minds because they're, they're the, you know, they live like multimillionaires when they only make 100K. So you can absolutely get into that situation. But it turns out that what the happiness researchers discovered essentially was that this amount of money provides security. And so now let's think about the monks for a second, right? Because, I mean, they're not like, you know, what's their deal? Like, they're, they don't have any money. They certainly don't have 100K. They don't have 150K. But they seem to be pretty happy and pretty chill. So now I'm going to ask you all the question, do monks have security? Does a monk need to worry about where they're sleeping at night? Does a monk need to worry about where their next meal is coming from? Does their monk need to worry about getting promoted? Does a monk need to worry about politics with their boss? Maybe, right, depending on where you're a monk. But so this is what's really interesting, is we, we sort of say that monks are not materialistic, but what we also actually see is that monks are actually very secure in their day-to-day -day life, for the most part, right? Like, people pay for their food through donations. They're like, housing is generally, like, accommodated. Most monks don't have to worry about paying rent at the end of the month. There's usually some kind of charitable organization or something like that where, like, monks will have, you know, they'll get medical care and things like that. Like, I, I haven't seen, you know, I've never seen a GoFundMe from a monk trying to pay medical bills. You'll see GoFundMe for, from people all the time, especially in the United States. But it's not like monks are out there 
you know, struggling to make ends meet. Now, some of them will choose to be, uh, you know, like poor and essentially will take vows of poverty and will then will also rely on the charity of others. But if you kind of think about how can that develop as a tradition, how can I choose being broke as a way of life? Because that's what the monks do. They're like, my way of life is I ain't going to do shit. And they're still alive after 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. How is that? It's because they actually have their security provided for them. So the first thing to understand is that the happiness research and the monks actually agree that the purpose of money is security when it comes to happiness. The second thing to understand is that if we look at happiness, there's a difference between gaining happiness and losing happiness. And especially with what insecurity does is it takes happiness away. It doesn't give you happiness, but it makes it so that if you have some amount of happiness, let's say I have 50 units of happiness, but then I can't pay my rent at the month, at the end of the month, I lose 30 units of happiness. That's what stress does to us. It takes our happiness away. It doesn't directly give it to us. So this is the first thing, right? Is now that we kind of look at this, once we understand how stress works, once we understand what money actually does for happiness, and even when we look at monks, we start to discover that actually all of these things are aligned. And the purpose of money in, in, in terms of how much it deals with happiness is essentially security. Now, even if we know that, it still doesn't really answer our original question, right? Because our original question is like, should I major in a STEM, should I become a STEM person like electrical engineering or like lawyer or whatever, or should I do what I love? It doesn't help us, even this amount of information doesn't help us make the choice. Which one should I do? Because if you're saying they're actually consistent, I still don't know how to pick. And that's why, thankfully, there's like way more research on happiness. And I'm going to share with you all a little bit more. So the first thing is that it appears that a lot of happiness correlates with something called savoring. So savoring is the ability to enhance or extend a positive emotional experience. I take some issue with the word emotional there, but a positive experience. So we know what it means to savor something, right? But essentially what happens is the more that you're able, able to savor things, the more happy you are. And we also know that, for example, money can negatively impact savoring. So if I buy, there's literally people did studies on this, right? So there's a causative, this is a causative study, by the way, not correlation, which is a huge difference. So people would give someone like a nice expensive chocolate and they'd ask them to eat the chocolate. And what we sort of found is that if you eat the chocolate, just by itself, and you really sit down and you enjoy it, it actually like brings you a lot of happiness. If you tell people how much the chocolate costs, or especially if they have to pay for it, it reduces the happiness. Now, this is a really important finding, okay? Because what this means is that if I'm rich, and I buy something nice, and I think about how much I paid for it, it will actually reduce the quality of savoring. This is what in, in, in scientific research is called kind of the dual nature of money and happiness, which is that money will allow you for certain possessions and things like that. And we'll get to that in a second. But the more that you think about money, the less you're actually able to savor things. And so this is a really important thing to understand is when we're really talking about what is happiness, we're sort of really zeroing on, on this quality of savoring. There are a couple of other really interesting things that we discovered from happiness research. The first is that Spending money on experiences is worth more than spending money on possessions, okay? So like if you have some amount of happiness, doing stuff with it as opposed to getting stuff with it will actually make you more happy. So let's say taking trips or like going whitewater rafting or going to a museum, like paying tickets for a museum is worth more happiness than let's say a microtransaction in a video game. So getting more stuff and being able to do things, doing stuff is actually worth more happiness than getting stuff. Second really interesting thing is that savoring experiences that are ordinary or extraordinary leads to about the same amount of happiness. So what that sort of means is that it's not like a $15 cup of coffee is more enjoyable than a $5 cup of coffee or a $3 cup of coffee or a $10 cup of coffee. The experiences that we go through, you don't have to visit the best museum in the world. You can just visit a decent museum. That sort of prioritizing experience is important, but it's not like extraordinary experiences are worth more 
than ordinary experiences. So I can go climb to the top of Mount Everest, which maybe that's an experience, but or I can hike for an hour, and that's to a certain degree that there's a lot of happiness in both of those. So it's not like the fancier stuff that gets posted on social media with the really epic vistas, and the tallest mountain in the world is better than the second tallest mountain in the world. Like, if you climb to the top of any mountain and you look out, it's going to be really enjoyable. So it's not like the extraordinary is actually greater than the ordinary. Second really, in really interesting thing. Third thing that's also kind of novel from happiness research is that generally speaking, spending money on other people brings more happiness than spending money on yourself. So this is kind of interesting as well. So we see like a lot of the value of altruism, whereas like if I work hard and I give something to another human being, that actually makes me happier than having stuff myself. And so if we look at some of these novel discoveries about the nature of money and happiness, we discover a lot of things that are also actually very consistent with monks. So the first is that a monk can savor a simple cup of tea, right? Like especially if you go to like Buddhist monasteries and stuff, they'll have like, um, you know, barley tea or green tea or something like that. And they'll sit there and they'll like enjoy like a simple cup of tea. And it's in the enjoyment of the simple thing, the act, that's really where the happiness comes from. And that's really what monks train to do, right? Because if you think about, okay, what is meditation? If you look at like these Zen masters, being a monk is a formal training in savoring. Being a monk is a formal training in extracting as much happiness as we can out of any experience. And so the cool thing about being a monk is that the more you level up your savoring skill, the more that you are able to actually extract positive enjoyment out of even seemingly neutral or negative experiences. And that's really where the monk training is, is really valuable. But as we end up discovering, you know, now we get a little bit closer to or the answer to our question which is a lot of people will say like, okay, so should I, should I go down this career path even if it doesn't make me happy? Because I'll get money, because money buys happiness, right? Up to a certain point. Well, no, that's not really how it works. Money provides security. Money also gives us the opportunity to create experiences. Money gives us, to a certain degree, the ability to help others, which will make us happy. So that's what money does. But the basic problem is that we think that the choice is what's going to make us happy, right? Because that's what really screws us. It was like, should I pick A or should I pick B? And the real lesson to take away from all this stuff is that the choice is not what brings the happiness. It's the way that we experience the choice that brings happiness. So it's not about picking the right major. It's how do you live your life with a particular major, right? So even if I pick a, a, a major that I don't like, and I work in a way that, you know, I, I don't find, it doesn't really attract me. But I can still enjoy lots of things about it, right? So I, I've had this experience myself where like, you know, you can still really enjoy a cup of coffee in the morning, even if you hate your job. And you can really enjoy the feeling of relief when you're done with your job that you hate. And then the other really wild thing is that even parts of your job, once you learn how to savor, there are parts of your job that you used to dislike, which you can start to like. So what we actually discover is that like the monks and all the happiness research are actually perfectly aligned. And I think the best example of this that I'll leave y'all with actually comes from the world of dating. So right now, everyone is out there looking for the perfect partner. And that was the promise of the dating apps, right? Is that you tell us exactly what you want and we will find it for you. We will look amongst all these billions of people on the planet. You give us a checklist of everything that you're looking for and we'll match you with the perfect person. Because that's what's going to lead to happiness, right? It's getting everything that you want. Whereas I come from a, a culture that it traditionally has arranged marriages. And if you kind of think about it, having an arranged marriage, you don't get to pick shit. You don't get to pick any of it. Someone else picked it for you. And so if picking what we want is the way that we get happiness, then it should follow that everyone who does online dating should be perfectly happy. And that no one who has an arranged marriage will ever be happy, right? Because they have no choice. Because the choice is what determines the happiness. But what we actually discover is that if you look at arranged marriages, it's people who change their experience within the marriage. It's not the choice itself. It's how they live in the marriage. It's how they learn to love someone. It's how they learn to accept someone. It's how the other person learns to love and accept them. That you can have incredibly happy marriages. 
So the problem that we face when we're trying to think, okay, should I do A or should I do B? Which one will make me happy? First of all, there's no, uh, there's no dispute between the happiness researchers and the monks. We all actually agree that you need some amount of security. And then the rest of it de is determined by how you live your life. That you prioritize experiences over possessions. That you try to use your money to help other people as opposed to yourself. But you need to be able to have the money to help other people and still pay your rent. And the more that you, you begin to realize that, then you'll start to realize that it's not the choice that brings happiness. It's what you do with it. It's how you live after. It's how you learn how to savor whatever comes after the choice that will ultimately bring you the happiness. Questions? Oh, yes. People are asking. Love can be learned? 100%. So if you want to understand why there's so little love in the world... It's because we forgot that learn love is a skill that you can learn. And we assumed that it was something that was prepackaged, perfectly formed, and then you go find it. So this is like, we're like a society who thinks that chairs can be found on the street instead of being built. And now we're wandering around. The whole society is wandering around looking for chairs. Because in your household, there were chairs. Right? So we've stopped... Learning how to love. And instead, we've started looking for it. So, Dr. K, confused about picking between pro gaming and CS major, what should I do? So, I can't tell if you're trolling or not, but let's assume that's a serious question because that's a common concern for a lot of people. trying to think about since you're interested in pro gaming. So I'm going to share something, okay? Don't read too much into it. So I've worked with about seven or eight esports teams, let's say. And sometimes what happens after a team has trouble is they think about, should I switch this player out or not? Should we find a new, new player? They think, which is the right choice? Should we stick with what we have or should we find a new player or a new team? And that's where, like, my answer to them is there isn't a right choice or a wrong choice. It's that whatever you pick is going to require work. All that's different is the kind of work that it's going to take after your choice. See, we think that making the right choice creates the right result. But it's not the choice that creates the result. It's what you do after the choice. So I'll see this a lot also like in, in medical school where people are like, okay, well, I love surgery and I love psychiatry. Which one should I pick? Which one will make me happier? And that's where I think people are losing the point. They're like thinking like, if I pick something, it'll make me happy. And that's why those people wind up unhappy because they think that the happiness comes from the choice. It's created afterward. And as long as you think that a particular thing is going to make me, you happy, and you strive for that thing, and then you get it, and then what happens? Those people aren't happy. Do you all get that? This is why people who look for happiness outside of themselves never find it. And I don't mean that in like a, here's my spiritual tweet for the day. I mean like literally think about it. Right? If I think that, because they think that happiness is just like something that you acquire. Right? It's like you open a treasure chest and boop, here's the happiness. I found it. Now I'm good. It doesn't work like that. It's created. This is why the research on savoring is so important. What we discover is that prioritizing experiences and learning how to savor is actually what leads to happiness. And so you can go, and this is what we end up with, right? Like, I want this thing. This thing will make me happy. And you get that thing. It makes you happy for like a day. Then you want something else. You're so excited to play this video game. This video game is so great, so great. Oh my God, it's so much fun. And then you finish, and then what? How long does the happiness from the video game last? Right? If video games actually made people happy, the industry would be dead. We wouldn't need any more, because we'd be done. This is what it means. It's not like some profound, like, oh, like happiness comes from within. Like literally, it's not like some weird spiritual metaphor. 
It's like you can eat as many fucking cookies as you want to in life. You can eat a cookie today. You're going to want one tomorrow. You can eat one tomorrow. You're going to want one the next day. You can get tired for them for a little while, and then you'll want something else. And then you're going to eat that, and you'll be happy for a little while. And then a month later, you're going to want a cookie again. This is not some profound spiritual realization. This is just like, just pay attention to yourself for like all of five minutes, and you will discover this. That the happiness doesn't come from the object itself. It comes from your experience of the object. So should you major in CS or should you become a pro gamer? That depends on how you live your life after making the decision. There isn't a right decision or a wrong decision. Should I take job A or should I take job B? Well, job A has these benefits and these weaknesses. Job B has these benefits and these weaknesses. So whether you're happy or not is not which job you choose. It's which way are you going to play the game after you pick a job? Am I going to take advantage of A, B, and C? And am I going to supplement and deal with D, E, and F that are the weaknesses? If the answer is yes, you will be happy in your job. So what we've done as a society, we have ceded control of our happiness to the outside world. We've given up. We've given up on our relationships. Because finding the right person, I met the one. It's the search for the one. Which implies that the happiness from the relationship comes from the other person. And boy, when we surrendered our happiness in a relationship to the other person, that's when we get fucked. Because they're responsible for it now. And whether we become happy or not depends on their behavior. We lose control of our lives. Same thing is happening in work. This job will make me happy. As soon as I get to the end of the rainbow, I will be happy. And then you're not happy. So what do you do? You go find another rainbow. And then you grind towards the end of it. And then you're not happy for long enough, so you look for another rainbow. This promotion, next promotion, next promotion, 50 grand more, 100 grand more, 200 grand more. That'll be happy, right? And all y'all are like, if you don't make 200 grand a year, 300 grand a year, like, of course, that'll make me happy. Think about all the crap I'll be able to do it. There's research that says that after 100 or 150K, it doesn't do anything. We've ceded control of our happiness to the outside world. And boy, has the outside world loved taking it from us, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to make you happy. Yeah, you want happiness? I can give you happiness. $5.99, this DLC. $2.99, this microtransaction. You need more lives on this level of jelly whatever, crunch? $0.99. Cents. I'll, give you, I'll make you happy. Just, just give me a dollar. Give me two. Give me five. Give me ten. Give me a hundred. Give me a thousand. I want to be happy. I need, I need a, a diamond. In order to be happy in this relationship, I need a diamond that's worth $50,000. Without the diamond, I'm not going to be happy. This is what I need to be happy. I, I deserve it. I deserve the best. Because I have self-esteem. And in that moment, what you're doing is surrendering your happiness to literally a chunk of carbon. And we wonder why no one is happy today. <laughs> because we gave it up. And there are people who are happy to profit off of it. They're like, great. You go, girl. You want 50K? Let me show you ads for 60K diamonds. And we wonder. It's not a knock against women, by the way. Men are the same, right? For men, it can be, I need my significant other, we're assuming a heterosexual relationship, to have tits that are this big. Same thing. Right? Sports cars, whatever. So if you're wondering, what should I do? So here's what I'd say. Start by prioritizing your security. Learn how to savor. And prioritize experiences over possessions. And spend your money on other people, at least some. These are the four things that'll make you happy in life. Easy.
Ah, this is great. So this is a wonderful question. How does the experience of going to a museum differ from the experience of gaming? Beautiful. So the main difference is one is easier to savor and one is harder to savor. So remember, the ability to savor is the ability to enhance and extend a positive emotional experience. So gaming is only fun while you're gaming. And then the second you're done with a match, what do you have to do to continue having fun? You don't savor at all. You just jump right in. So the difference between a museum is a museum is more conducive to savoring. And then people may say, but hold on a second, Dr. K. I've savored some of my video game experiences, as have I. And those are the video game experiences that I love and don't regret for a moment. That's what being a healthy gamer is about. Savoring your gaming. I still remember ladder matches from StarCraft 1 on island maps when I was playing Protoss. Like, I still remember Dungeons & Dragons sessions. I still remember a couple of epic comebacks in Dota. I still remember playing Unreal Tournament. Those are the experiences that are worth savoring. But what I think is actually like worse about gaming is that gaming itself is not monolithic. There are some games that could be savored. Like, I think Elden Ring is moving in that direction, right? You can savor Elden Ring. You don't have to microtransact your way to anything. It's not about winning or losing. It's like, there isn't a best weapon and a worst weapon. The best weapon is what are, people are like, what kind of armor do you want to wear? It's like fashion souls. Like, forget about best. I'm going to create an experience. And even if you're a video game designer, and this is where, like, we've done consulting for video game companies. What we advocate is this is that we think about video games as evil. They're not evil. Parents think about them as evil. Whether they're evil or not depends on how we make them. Right? So like, even if you're playing a video game, savor it. I know it's kind of bizarre. After you play for a little while, go for a walk. Think about how much fun you had today. Because one of two things will happen. Either you'll savor it, and it'll be just as fun to walk as it will to play. Or, if you're like me, at one point you'll make a shocking discovery. Which is that actually, you didn't enjoy it. And actually, you feel like you're waking up from being passed out from drinking too much. And you're hungover from playing way too much. And that's when you know you're an unhealthy gamer. If you can't savor it, don't play it. <laughs> Savoring is the ability to enhance and prolong or extend a positive experience. Yeah, savor this stream. <laughs> Thankfully, you don't have to because it'll, it'll be a VOD. <laughs> but yeah, I think, I think Watashi no Tomodachi is, is got, it, got it right on, right? Like, live today, y'all. Live. Go and live. It's not about money or possessions or having this or having that. Like, go and live. And so I see a bunch of people who have collections. What do you do with your collection? So I'd encourage you to sit and enjoy it. Sit and enjoy what life offers you. Instead of trying to get more. life enjoyers <laughs> all right so seriously though there should be life enjoyers in chat that's what we need right that's what we're here for and i'm thrilled like so check out right in the feels because that seems to be a good opportunity to like teach y'all how to savor stuff sound good chat enjoyers okay i am running late today i ranted a little bit so we're gonna have to we're skipping meditation way too much, so I'm going to have to figure out what to do about that. Oh, no. Oh, no.
know. I need a token. Can anybody raid for me? Any mods in chat that can raid? Mods, mods, mods. Otherwise, GG. Looks like no raid today. Okay, maybe. All right, well. All right. GG. No, I'm not logged into this. Who should I raid? I can try. Nope. Time for some savoring, I suppose, chat. No, mods aren't fired, right? So this is where... Hold on a second. Hold on a second, chat, before we get mad at mods. We can use this as our brief meditation for the day. So when something in our life doesn't go the way that we want, are we going to let the lack of mods determine how happy we are in this moment? Nope. We're not going to let that determine our lack of happiness. We're going to acknowledge that human beings have lives and responsibilities and that we were hoping to raid someone today, but we won't be able to. And that's okay. It doesn't have to mess up the rest of my day. It doesn't have to mess up the rest of yours. I know it's kind of bizarre. You guys may find this shocking. But did you know that you can go to any channel that you want to on Twitch without it being a raid? You can actually pick whatever you want. Like, you don't even need me to raid. Did y'all realize that? You can just go do whatever you want. You don't even have to continue watching Twitch after we're done. That's so... Like, I could end the stream right now, and then you could go off and actually do something with your life. 